really important for us as Naga people, and especially I see a lot of young faces around, elders and my colleagues in the audience as well. And to kind of have this practice in us, you know, we have the Naga ancestral homeland is big. It is across various territorial boundaries. Uh, often we talk about our tribal colleagues and classmates, our cohort in terms of districts. As Naga community, our ancestral homelands today are defined as districts, upper range, lower range, as colonies. Uh, all of you bright students, the inheritors of our Naga future. The Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, England opened their doors to the public after being closed due to COVID-19 pandemic. During the closure, they undertook a comprehensive review of the program and approach to exhibiting cultural objects from all over the world. The Pitt Rivers Museum decided to remove any human remains from the exhibition and renewed their efforts to work with different communities to return ancestral human remains taken during the period of British imperialism. The Pitt Rivers Museum has officially and explicitly stated that they are committed to change. By this, they mean that they are open to reconciling with different communities all over the world from where various cultural objects and human remains have come to them. They aim to explore how healing may be achieved through working closely with these communities. The Naga human remains are part of this endeavor. For more than a hundred years, human remains of Naga ancestors and sacred cultural objects collected by British explorers, administrators, military officers, and anthropologists were taken from the Naga homelands and placed in museums, libraries, and private collections across the world. Categorized as insensitive displays that highlighted the violent history of colonization and imperialism, this is part of the museum's larger goal of decolonizing the museum, which is aimed to start a process of redress and healing, which includes mending of fraught colonial past that was difficult and painful, and prioritizing reconciliation and co-curatorship with source communities. In this case of the Naga ancestral human remains, it is the Naga people, you and I together. The Pitt Rivers Museum possesses the largest Naga collection in the world today. There are approximately 6,459 items comprising of human remains and both human and non-human remains like textiles, baskets, musical instruments, wood carvings, hunting and farming tools, and jewelry. Today, as Nagas continue to seek reconciliation and healing from a history of violence and militarization, the unconditional return of our ancestors' remain is highly significant. The act of bringing them home means that they can be safely returned to their homeland. This undertaking is a profound collective effort through which the Naga people will have an opportunity to heal and facilitate a dialogue to address a violent historical past and mend broken relationships. Since the Forum for Naga Reconciliation, FNR, ongoing work with the communities and groups is focused on reconciliation and healing, they have been responding and reflecting on historical violence. And it is with this backdrop that the Pitt Rivers Museum reached out to the Forum for Naga Reconciliation, urging the forum to facilitate a process of community dialogue to decide the future care and or return of Naga ancestral human remains. As part of this facilitating process, the FNR formed a group called Recover, Restore, and Decolonize. The acronym is RAD, R-R-A-D to study and network with indigenous experts, conduct participatory action research, generate public awareness, and develop a strong and viable case to make an official claim to the University of Oxford. I have often heard Angami elders say, Kepenyofen, Nagamia Krippe Kriso. 
In English, we would say, God is partial in his love for the Nagas. Or, Isordo Naga Manohanya Allah Pram Morom Gre. I believe there is truth in this. In spite of our weaknesses and imperfections, and even though we keep failing him, God's love for us has never wavered. Whether we agree or not, the fact of the matter is, we are here today by grace. By the grace of a higher being who lords over our destiny. Traditional belief, Christian belief, and rational reasoning all demand that we not take this grace for granted. At a time when we are so divided by tribalism and petty politics among ourselves, this moment has presented itself to us to sit together, join hands, and work together for the common good of all Nagas. I believe that we are in a moment of historical significance. Here is history in the making. A golden opportunity has been handed to us to take control of our own narrative, to write our own story, and create the kind of history we want to leave behind as a legacy. The ball is in our court. We have been given center stage. Can we unite as a people and rise up to the occasion? I agree that we have to begin by recognizing and accepting that ours is a history of colonization and imperialism, and that even today, we continue to exist or live in a state of neo-colonialism. That is why it is so important for our voices to be heard, and equally important to have rational and fruitful conversations like the one we are having today, through which we can contribute possible ways of going forward. Thirdly, I have a few points and suggestions to share. And these thoughts have been put together after discussions and consultations with different individuals in my own capacity. I have summed them up this way. Uh, I don't put them forward as um, ready-made solutions, but I hope that uh, putting forward these suggestions will um, help in opening up the discussion. Number one, regarding the repatriation of human remains, we have learned that there are differing opinions on this, and we must take all into account. However, since it is a humongous task that entails so many aspects, perhaps if individuals and communities were to each have it their way, it would make things more complicated. Therefore, a possible way forward is to have a common place where all the Naga ancestral human remains are laid to rest in a way that is acceptable and honorable to all. And this physical site can be built as a memorial to our ancestors. Perhaps this would be a most appropriate way of uniting to honor them. It would be a place where anyone can come and pay homage to them. It would also become a site of historical importance. Further, it would serve to be a tangible heritage site that reminds us of our history, lest we forget. Our history will not be forgotten as long as such a memorial exists. We have the Commonwealth War Cemetery right in the middle of the town in Kohima. It is a memorial to those who died for their countries during the Second World War. But we do not have any common Naga memorial where our ancestors who died while history was being made are honored and tribute is paid to them. Can we not turn this opportunity into something meaningful and beautiful for ourselves and for posterity? Will this not be a restorative and healing act what we do or do not do today will be our history tomorrow. Is this not a God-given opportunity for us to come together 
and build something that honors our ancestors, and at the same time, reminds us of our history and heritage, something that will enable to keep our story alive. My second point is regarding the other cultural objects and artifacts in the Pit Rivers Museum. Uh, though the topic today is, uh, at the moment, is about the uh, repatriation of the human remains, since there are other objects and artifacts also in the museum, I would like to uh, put forward this suggestion as well. Can we to build a state-of-the-art museum come cultural research center where all these precious objects and artifacts can be housed and continue to be displayed in our ancestral homeland? We cannot bring them back to let them disintegrate and waste away because of the lack of infrastructure. The Naga anthropologists and archaeologists can come together and take the lead, perhaps by forming a society, if there isn't one yet. The specialists of the field should be the ones to decide how to get it done. I do not know if there are any Nagas who have studied or are studying museology, but I think the need of the art is to have our people equipped with such kind of knowledge to be curators of museums. Things come to fruition. Of course, the big question is, who will fund these projects? I understand that it is definitely an impossible task for the FNR and the project team to carry out this by themselves. So the next point of suggestion is, why not get the state government uh, government's support in funding. Or better still, if it does not violate the terms of negotiation between the Pitt Rivers Museum and the FNR, why not include this even in the framework agreement with government of India? After all, it is about the preservation of Naga cultural heritage. If our neighbors, the Assamese, could negotiate with government of India and include the establishment of a cultural in institution in the Assam Accord 1985. Can we not do the same? The Srimanta Sankaradev Kalakshetra, the Assamese Cultural Museum, was established to protect, preserve, and promote the cultural, linguistic identity and heritage of the Assamese people. Um, my moderator, uh, today is asking me about you know the, the journey from the heart and why is this a journey from the heart? Um, it just came. I didn't make it up. And the first talk in Dimapur was on I think the human remains repatriation and that was the title. And I reflected before I came to Kohima to meet you all and to reflect together and I sat down and I had my quiet time. It just came to my heart. And I thought that, you know, there, there should be no way, I think, to look at this process than, than through love, affection, and through vulnerable spaces. We are really charting an uncharted territory. Nothing of this sort has been done. And it sits heavy on us, on our souls and our body. And it is only through heart connections that I feel that we can support one another and travel one another travel together in this journey thank you sophie lasu and i have a question for dolly um, earlier in your presentation you had mentioned that this um remains these human remains are private collection so the first thing that came to my mind was how did it become private was it sold or you know, uh, when you see a private collection, is there a, you know provenance so that you know if it's going to be uh, say returned back to uh, Nagaland, how do we identify you know whom it belongs to? And so that's a really good question. And for for the Naga team, in the last two years, we have been grappling with that. And so when we say private collection, in the in the field of I think uh, antique yeah collection. Uh, collectors, you might come across art pieces and you hear that, you know, it belongs to a 
private collector, right? Uh, seldom are art pieces, uh, maybe, you know, unless they are bought by the state from state funds, maybe the state of Nagaland or, or the state of New York, it would belong to, to the government. Uh, in the case of the Naga people, like many indigenous communities going through colonization, uh, first they were taken under duress during expeditions, and they were passed down and as, as a private uh, collection uh, through inheritance. Among, among European families, you know, great-great-grandfather, you know, who, who might have been an uh, administrator in the Naga Hills. Uh, and at some point, seriously, who wants, right, skeletons hanging out in the living room? It's not cool. You would want, much rather have, have Picasso if you're a rich guy. Uh, and so they were given away to museums. Uh, given that the University of o Oxford and the, and the museums are part of, you know, the, the university, uh, this, this, this collections were donated, most of them. Majority of them were donated. All of them, in fact, were donated. And here we are talking about uh, Hutton and Mills donations, majority. And, and some of the few donations that came from private collectors from European families who didn't want these collections anymore in their houses. And all Naga spear, which have zero meaning for them. Uh, and, I, and I'm sure that many of our Naga heritage, tangible material things were also disposed of. You know, this, that families didn't want it. You might just find them in some of the thrift stores, do, yeah, second and dukan, you know, across Europe, if you're traveling, who knows? So, so that's been the, so, so, so that's been the, 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 the process. And um, the second point is that it brings us to the legal complexities. Uh, when we were talking to Naga elders, they said, oh, you know, uh, British government, you know, we go back to that. And so the curators and the directors were saying, no, it is a private property of the University of Oxford. And as Naga people, we have to make an appeal to them. And that's where the consent uh, uh, process comes. And I think I'm sure the FNR members who are here, Akam and others, would be able to uh, elaborate on the processes with the, with our uh, Naga elders from different tribes, you know, the discussion that's been going on. So I, I hope that's... I was just wondering, uh, when you said about human remains, is it just the skull or is it the full skeletal remains? Because just the skull would make a lot of difference with the skeletal remains, the remaining part of the skeletal remains, because skull means it will be a trophy. And the full skeletal remains could be a natural death, because uh, in the past, um, the, 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 they do secondary burial. The flesh are decomposed first, and then they do secondary burial. So I was just wondering, what kind of skeletal remains, human remains, are lying there in the museum? I've seen the book, uh, I've seen in the book, The Nagas by Julian Jacobs, but um, uh, the ones which you are mentioning, were they labeled properly? Are they, are they with proper labels? Identify the families if 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 it's a skull or if it is the full skeletal remains. Thank you so much for for the question and the the trophies. Yes, the trophy heads are part of the collection. You're right, and a piece of the jaw, or perhaps a femur, or ribs, or maybe a part of the skull. And given the size and the formation of the bone, the, the list that we got uh, uh, also contained skeletal remains of children as young as nine from villages that were taken away. Uh, and so not all collections in the human remains actually are from, you know, quote unquote, the head hunting period. Uh, they, they, I think, must have been buried as, as normal burial processes that our ancestors practiced. So, so it's a long list. Um, the second part is actually the gray areas because for a lot of the baskets and the exhibitions that are still on uh, display at the Petriverse Museum contains uh, teeth, contains hair. Um, and so they are definitely, when it comes to definition, they are part of what human remains because both the hair and the teeth would have it. But 
for the curators, that's where the ongoing work of pulling them down with respect so that no part of indigenous communities' human remains are displayed. That conversation is still ongoing. And we need many more people actually to work with us to think about this together. Um, the third issue about tracing families, that we need to think about it together because of first, the migration stories of our ancestors. Some of the villages must have moved because we're looking at more than 150 years, right? Some of the, and, and for us, at least among the Lotas, I knew that, you know, if the water and the land, there was an epidemic, ancestors would move from the land and they would live and make new villages. And so it's part of a heritage and a culture that we have it. And for the list, like you rightly said, where we cannot trace, and majority of it, how can we trace just a body part? Uh, and it's also complicated in terms of categorization because the list, except for the trophies where the, where the names are tattooed on the skull, the names of villages and you know the names of the chiefs, those are very clear, but majority of them have been categorized by uh, white curators by European curators and European anthropology and archaeology students with no access to any kind of Naga language. None of them were done in collaboration. And so this has been a huge oversight. So for us, this is the first time that as Naga people with the FNR, we are stepping up to say, hang on, right? They have families and they have a people. So I think that's where our sister Elizabeth's point about what do we do, right, about a huge chunk which remains uh, vague and ambiguous, and that's where we need to come together as a people to think about it. Thank you. I had heard that there's the difficulty of tracing uh, uh, some uh, of the human remains, identifying uh, which family they belong to, or to which tribe, or which village, and all. Uh, so. In that case, even if we keep on searching, uh, I, I think uh, practically it would be very difficult to find clear answers. So that is why one of my suggestions was just because uh, we cannot identify them does not mean that we don't claim them. They are still our Naga ancestors. Whoever, uh, whichever family they came from, whichever tribe or village they came from, we cannot, uh, you know, uncount them and uh, decide not to uh, claim them uh, in the homecoming process of uh, uh, this human remains. So that is why my suggestion was perhaps if we are to all try to, uh, you know, uh, uh, give them an honorable burial or whatever way, in whatever way the, uh, the human remains are to be laid to rest. If every community were to decide by themselves or uh, they want to do things their own way, things may be a little complicated. And somewhere along the, uh, the way, uh, we may also lose the historical significance of re bringing back all these to our own ancestral lands. So that is why my suggestion was to have a common memorial place where all of the human remains are given equal honor and laid to rest uh, in that manner. ...experience, immediately through maybe the scholarships and monographs by the likes of Mill and Hutton. So their accounts are once removed, as it were. So um, how might we grapple with the difference in the means through which we gain knowledge of Naga culture? And a second part to this question is, um, given this, uh, since many contemporary research still studies their monographs, to begin with the awareness that the field of knowledge and wisdom and scholarship is a fraught one. And especially for indigenous people across the world, where the Naga people are also part of it, to understand that we cannot perhaps make the foundation of our knowledge a colonial one. And as you're putting it, as a young student, that is the wisdom that you start with. The second one is that, in my own case, when I was a student, I learned from my teachers, definitely we cannot call for censorship. People will continue to read Mills, Hutton, and Heimendorf. What we need to do then is that 
what other indigenous scholars and African American thinkers and students who now have reading lists in parallel with your own people and writings about slavery, about, about racism. And I think that helps. I'll just give you an example. So when I was a student, I read this wonderful uh, woman, uh, Zora Neale Hurston. Zora Neale Hurston um, was an African-American student whose family came from the plantations that, and traced her family lineage to the slavery. Uh, she never got a job in the academy in the United States and because she wasn't quote-unquote good enough. So you had these huge mega stars like Ruth Benedict, if you do American anthropology, Ruth Benedict, uh, Krober, they all dismissed her as a person who wasn't able to think well. And Zora Neale Hurston died in poverty. She worked as a janitor towards the end of her life and no one remembered her. Uh, if you remember the book, uh, The Color Purple, Alice Walker, when she was a student, she went in search of Zora Neale Hurston's legacy. You can find this all on the net. And it was Alice Walker, Walker as an undergrad student who revived that entire conversation among her own peers. What we have done as indigenous scholars and and, and looking at anthropology and decolonizing it today is to make sure that when we teach the godfathers of anthropology in the West, like Krober and Milanovsky, we make sure that the students are reading Zora Neale Hurston and her work. Skull trophy that uh, we the Nagas as headhunters, you know, like we're talking about bringing our Naga remains from uh, abroad to our land, but how about uh, have you, as with the FNR, have you consulted with the uh, uh, Naga villages, you know, where they have kept the skulls as a trophy and still preserved around in some villages? And uh, how about like sending them back, you know, to because those were the enemy's skulls, right? And uh, naturally, it doesn't belong to the village, it belongs to the other village. And so, have you consulted or have you, are you? in any kind of a process towards that. The cultural associations discussing that. And I think our, the ground team and elders would have a better answer. But, but you know, as, uh, from, from my knowledge, I think there's a... Nagaland TV, Sop Manulaga Awas. Watch us live on Geo TV and on your television sets as well. For Dumapu viewers, we are on channel number 994 in Global Chapter. And Kohima and Mokokchong viewers, switch to channel number 138 on Hornbill Digital. For all news and updates, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter.